Now this is a pure coincidence uh, that we have the choir from the College of Western here today, uh, but it's appropriate uh, based on our scripture. And uh, the one thing I want to say about this piece of scripture is uh, that many pieces of our songs that come in our hymnal are from Psalm 98. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. No doubt you've heard that quote in this scripture. But what you may not know is that the original Hebrew, it's not make a joyful noise, it's shout, shout, shout to the Lord all the earth. And you can think about all the noise that comes forth from the earth and think about the noise of the animals and the breeze and, and the rivers as they flow, all of that being a symbol of praise to God. Now we, we kind of like our worship quiet and order. And so for us this morning to be commanded by the scripture to shout is a little out of our nature, I would say. What's all that shouting about? We catch a cab, we sell a product, we say to our children, hey, you kids, be quiet in there. A shout involves an emotion. And that emotion can be good or that emotion can be bad. Now, I spend a lot of my time telling people to keep your voice down. Because as soon as you start to yell, everybody's anxiety level begins to rise. So keep it down, right? Some teachers call it inside voices, right? But I know a lot of people who go to concerts. They go to sporting events. And they have shouted so much that they can't even speak the next day. They're hoarse. Now, there was a lot of shouting at the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall yesterday. They were shouting for some good things, for freedom, for the end of a division between people, for choosing community over isolation. So I want to ask you, when you come to church here on Sunday morning, did you ever go home forced after worship? <laughs> we might sometimes. I have, actually, sometimes. But the title of Psalm 98 if you look in your Bible, uh, one of the, the uh, versions that I have, they title Psalm 98, Joy to the World. Now, how many of us have been here on Christmas Eve when we hear some of the spirit that these songs are sung with? When we have communion, I always think about this phrase. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Joyful feast. Sing to the Lord a new song. Some of the best worship that we have is when we put our head and our heart together. There's a farmer named Wendell Berry, and uh, in 1985, he wrote <coughs> a, uh, a, an article, and the title of the article is What Are People For? What Are People For? So there are ways you can look at that phrase, but he was uh, dismayed uh, at the uh, continuing uh, artificial creation of food and the loss of land by uh, modern day farmers. And that has just increased in the last 30 years. That automation and robotics and, and uh, intelligence and uh, very sophisticated computer systems have now taken over the role that many people who were involved in agriculture had. And he asked that question, what are people for anymore? And he felt that there was a sense of being diminished because he felt that he was offering a contribution to the world by the work that he did. And isn't it true that we measure uh, our well-being by our feeling of the contribution that we made to the world? I remember the farmers in Southern Illinois when I first started out there. Uh, and one of the farmers said to me, uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, at the end of World War II, they came and they told us that we were going to feed the world and we should produce as 
much as possible because we were going to get food out to all corners of the earth. And he said, and now they pay me not to plant anything in my fields. He, his sense of well-being had been diminished because he felt he wasn't making a contribution. We also have to have a sense of meaning and work. Maybe that's one of the key problems in our time today uh, is that we don't honor the work of other people enough. That we don't realize that we become our work and our work ties us to people in positive ways. Douglas John Paul has a book, it's called The Steward, a biblical symbol that has come of age. So all the parables of Jesus have these servants, have these stewards who don't own the property, but they take care of it for someone else. And so Jesus suggests that God has given each of us a place to care for and to watch over and to use the power that we have and the life force that we have to be up and about handling the things that God has given us with heart and head and voices. I went to a seminar one time on, uh, on business and what people do in their role and in their work. And they said the number one thing was expectations. And that anybody, anytime they enter into a situation, wants to know, the first question they want to know is what is expected of them. And the second question is about investment. And to ask yourself, where have I invested myself? What is it that I've believed in with my head, with my heart, and I've sacrificed for that greater good? And third, we always have to be aware of our intentions and of setting our intentions. I like that great word in the United Church of Christ statement of faith, aimlessness and sin. A aimlessness. So often parts of our life are kind of aimless. There's sort of aimlessness about it. And God calls us to be intentional. Now, we would never think to say that we don't care about suffering in the world. But what do we say about our actions with our giving? There's a saying in the United Church of Christ, to care is to do. And it's important for us to pay attention to the things that we do, because those are the things that we care about. And to remember that when you say yes to something, you also necessarily are saying no to something else. So according to the Isley brothers and Otis Day, love is an energy that makes you want to shout Kick your heels up and shout. Throw your hands up and shout. Throw your head back and shout. Love's an energy. To care is to do. To care means to take care, to be a caretaker, to be a steward. And you all do have something you put energy into. You have a vocation. You're a parent. You're a teacher. You're a citizen. You're fellow members in the household of God. You're a child of God. So many times when something happens in the world, something unsettling or something that we know ought not to be, people will come to me and they'll say, I have to do something. And in the life of the church, we need to be able to say, these are the things that we can do to make a difference. To care. To care for the situation. That's why we have a Wednesday night prayer and communion service. Because there are so many times that we feel that there is nothing that we can do, but we can pray about it. And when we pray about things, we start to think about things that we can do. We never. Last week, uh, there was a man named Zacchaeus up in a tree. He wanted to do good, but he didn't know what to do.
do until Jesus came into town. Now there are so many times when we have volunteers come through here, and we don't, we ought to, uh, but we don't keep track of how many volunteers serve here each week, but I'm sure if we count everything we do, it's almost as many as we have here at Sunday morning. Because we have people who act as mentors in recovery groups, we have uh, large breakfast crews that come through every day, we have people from the church who come in and they're involved in some kind of ministry. And we don't keep track of that, but it's a way uh, for us to engage people who want to do good. When we have volunteers with North Street Ministry, and they go out into the world, when they work in our breakfast program, we show them what is possible in other places. Because people want to do good. They want to be engaged in their community, but sometimes they just don't know how to go about that. And they don't know where to start. So the first important thing that we do is we take those good intentions that people have and put them into a channel to help them to do the thing that they feel God is calling them to do. So what kind of uh, spiritual investments are you making? What is the wisest investment that you ever made. I think if some of us think about it, it's maybe a certain kind of class we had our children take, or the time that we spent with them around the dining room table. That was time well spent because we were developing our relationships with other people. And I want you to think about coming to worship as itself an investment. And that you come to invest in the people around you. You invest in the people around you with your love and with your welcome and with your prayers for their concerns. What kind of investments do we make in subtle ways? When I was at the church in Illinois, I tried to encourage our uh, youth group to give $15 a month to sponsor a girl in Honduras. Her name was Lydia Marta Fernandez. And it provided a meal and schooling for her. And it's kind of hard, this is kind of hard to get 15 teenagers to give a dollar a week so we can sponsor Lydia Marta Fernandez. But they have gotten letters back from her. She has a family in her own. She has a house of her own because we stimulate 15 teenagers to give a dollar a month to help her go to school. She writes letters back to that church about how much that meant to her. And she said, I thank God for helping me through you. It's a small thing, but it was done with intention. It was done with thoughtfulness. And it's a very simple thing that almost all of us can do. And it took the church to be the method to say, this is what you can do about the world. This is what you can do about developed countries. Spend time with each other to make small sacrifices. Jesus said, this is the pearl of great price. Don't miss the gospel. This is the pearl of great price. The connection that we have for with other people. The service that we're able to provide in small and large ways. In Romans 8, Paul said, What then should we say about all these wonderful things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The one who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else for all of us. So when you wake up in the morning, do you know what people are for? Do you know that people are for love? That people are for the world? And people who wake up in the morning and know what they are for do rare things. So why are we all still trying to hope in the world? Why are we all still trying to make a community of faith work? Why are we still hanging on to the teachings of Jesus? Because they help us to understand what people are for. And according to the teachings of Jesus, our investments return the greatest 
Now, when parents bring that little baby up, we don't know if that little baby will become a saint or a holy terror. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. We follow behind Jesus who tells us to promise our love, our support, and our care. During a marriage, we offer a blessing. During confirmation, we uh, affirm the path that they're on and say, keep going in. When we have our youth year for graduations, we're saying to them, they are people who are for the world and we are for you. Everything that Jesus did was a sign of the kingdom. And we are for God and for others because God is for us. And what makes Jesus special is that he follows through on his promise of what people are for. Because at the communion table, Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is given for you. This is the covenant that is given for you. So these are our expectations. We ask what is expected of you. Sometimes if you walk into a room or if you go to a job and nobody tells you exactly what you're supposed to be doing, you're aimless, right? You are nervous and you're kind of uncertain that you might have a social faux pas or something. You don't know what's expected of you. But in the life of the church, we know that to care is to do. And we know that since God is for the world, we also are a part of that mission as students. A lot of people ask me, what does your church believe? Well, that's pretty tough in the United Church of Christ, because we're not free. We believe that the Spirit moves through every person, and every person has their own sense of calling. It was an amazing thing last week to see those seven pastors up here, right? 317 years of ministry, more than the history of our church, gone out into the world. And you'll notice that each one of those people, they had their unique interests, and they had their unique gifts, and they all didn't do the same thing. Some of them went out and they did drug addiction recovery. Some went out and they worked in the VA. Some went out and they worked in an inner city uh, mission for after school program. They all went out, they took who they were and what God had spoken to them, and they went out in the world for the world, for that community. So when people ask me about what does your church believe, I tell them to read the banner out front. Rainbow banner we put up. We voted in ONA in 2015. Be the church. We have to have stewards to protect the environment. It might be one of the most important. <coughs> Care for the poor. Forgive all. Reject racism. <laughs> Fight for the powers. Share earthly and spiritual resources. Embrace diversity. Love God. Enjoy this life. Anything that we do is a sign of the kingdom. It's a sign of a new way of life on this earth. And a new way for people to relate to one another. Some people ask me about the breakfast program. I say, it's a sign of the kingdom. Jesus said, gather people together and feed them. God's mission is our joy and religion, wherever we practice it. We ask where we've invested our life, what are people for. And at Trinity, we are for God and for one another. On Stewardship Sunday, we shout what we are for. We know that to care is to do, and 
we wonder what it might happen if we considered the entire ministry of our church to be up and about a shout of joy to the world. Because we know what we're here 